Hello dreamers and doers. Today we embark on a journey of self-discovery and empowerment. A journey that promises to unlock the boundless potential within you and propel you towards extraordinary success. Whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur, a creative artist, or a determined individual with big dreams, the message we'll explore today is clear. You're going to surprise the world with your success. In a world often plagued by doubt and uncertainty, it's easy to lose sight of our own potential and the impact we can make. But today, I invite you to cast aside those doubts and embrace a new paradigm. One where your success knows no bounds and your potential knows no limits. You see, each and every one of us possesses within us the seeds of greatness, unique talents, passions, and strengths waiting to be unleashed upon the world. And while the journey to success may be filled with challenges and obstacles, it is also rich with opportunity and possibility. As we journey together today, I encourage you to envision the remarkable future that awaits you. Picture yourself achieving your wildest dreams, making a profound impact on the lives of others, and leaving an indelible mark on the world. Because, my friend, that future is not just a possibility, it's a certainty. So, are you ready to embrace your potential and surprise the world with your success? If so, let's embark on this transformative journey together and unleash the greatness that lies within you. Remember, it's not what happens to you in life that determines how you feel. It's how you respond to what happens. Two people can have the same experience, but one will overcome it. Let it go. Forget about it and move on with their day or their life. The other person will be devastated, angry, resentful, often unhappy for an extended period of time. Same event, two different reactions. Your natural state is to be happy, healthy, joyful, and full of emotions for being alive. You should wake up every morning eager to start the day, feel wonderful about yourself and the relationships in your life. As a mature functioning adult, you should do things every day that allow you to progress toward realizing your full potential. You should be grateful for all your blessings in every area of your life. If this isn't the case, it's because you're not thinking correctly about life. Fortunately, what you'll learn today in this video can be very helpful in getting you back on track. Get comfortable and share this video on your social networks. Let's get started. How to find opportunity in a crisis. Brian Tracy gives meaning to everything. Nothing is but thinking makes it so. The fastest way to transform from negative to positive and free yourself from unhappy experiences of the past is to decide to see your past in a different way. When you practice the law of the situation and exchange a positive thought for a negative one, your emotions change almost instantly. Many people spend decades complaining about things their parents did when they were growing up. That was true in my case. I remember once when I was three and a bit years old and was out with a young woman during dinner. I started to remember and complain about my father for the mistakes he made with me during my childhood. The young woman, quite clever, stopped me and asked, Brian, are you glad to be alive? I said, of course I really enjoy my life. She then said, well, your father brought you here, so stop complaining. I remember being momentarily stunned and then realizing that she was right. From that day on, I never complained again. No matter what your parents did, they brought you here. They gave you the greatest gift of all. Your life. You can always be grateful to them for that. Here's an exercise for you. Imagine that somewhere in the universe, there's a great power that loves you and wants the best for you. This great power wants you to be happy, healthy, and fulfilled. It wants you to be successful and prosperous. This great power also knows that you can reach higher levels of happiness, joy and pleasure only by learning certain essential lessons along the way. And it knows that you have a perverse nature. You won't learn unless it hurts. You can't learn from reading or watching others' experiences. You can only learn when you feel physical, emotional or financial pain. It takes pain to get your attention so you can learn the lessons you must learn. Therefore, in order to teach you, train you and guide you toward your higher good, this great power sends you lessons each accompanied by pain, so you listen and pay attention. Norman Vincent Peale once said, when God wants to send you a gift, he wraps it in a problem. The bigger the gift God wants to send you, the bigger the problem he wraps it in. When you view each problem or difficulty you have in your life as containing some kind of gift, you begin to see things differently. The challenge for most people is that they experience the pain, but they're so busy complaining and blaming others that they never see the gift. 
Think about all the problems you have in your life right now. Now imagine that you've been sent this big problem that contains a gift in the form of a lesson you need to learn so you can be happier and more successful in the future. What is that lesson? One of the most powerful ways to change your thinking and your life is to seek the valuable lesson in every problem or difficulty you encounter. The most amazing thing is that if you look for a lesson in a setback or difficulty, you'll always find at least one lesson, and sometimes many more. This video is about how to learn to find that gift that God puts in every problem. So, below, you'll find an exercise that will help you with this. Pay attention, and put it into practice. Exercise. List three setbacks or temporary failures you have experienced in your life. Now reinterpret them and see them as learning experiences. What valuable lessons was the great power trying to send you? When you think about your biggest problem today, which usually involves another person, ask yourself, what is the lesson I must learn from this problem or difficulty? Your first response will usually be simple and superficial. Perhaps it should be more of this or less of that. But now comes the most important part. Ask yourself, what else is the lesson I must learn in this situation? Go deeper this time. The lesson will be more significant and meaningful, if not painful. Maybe you need to start doing something different or completely let go of something. Then ask again, what else is the lesson I must learn? Go even deeper. As you continue asking this question, the lessons will become increasingly relevant and helpful, and often also more painful. Finally, if it's a significant problem in your life that you've been struggling with for a long time, you will reach the true lesson you need to learn. Typically, you need to change, move away from something, or remove it from your current life. Language is very important in this area. The words you choose to interpret an event can trigger positive or negative thoughts, feelings, emotions, and reactions. Words can make you happy or sad, encourage or discourage you, excite or depress you. One of the fastest ways to change your mind from negative to positive when something goes wrong is to change your vocabulary. For example, instead of the word problem, use the word situation. A problem is negative, immediately evoking images of loss, delay, and inconvenience. But the word situation is neutral. When you say, here we have an interesting situation, there is no negative emotional charge associated with the word. As a result, you remain calm, clear-headed, and more capable of facing any situation. An even better word is challenge. Instead of reacting to a difficulty as if it were a problem or a personal attack against you or your business, say, we have an interesting challenge to face. A challenge is something you rise to. It brings out the best in you. It's positive and uplifting. We eagerly anticipate challenges that make us expand and become better by overcoming them. The best word to describe a problem is opportunity. Instead of thinking of problems or difficulties, from now on, talk about unexpected setbacks in your life as challenges or opportunities. An opportunity is something we all want and eagerly await. It's amazing how many of your best opportunities first appear as problems and difficulties. Many people have experienced what's called a near-death experience, usually in the midst of surgery. They die, their heart stops and their brainwave activity ceases. Fortunately, the miracles of modern medicine resuscitate them and bring them back to life on the operating table. Many of these people have reported a similar experience after they died. First, they saw themselves dead on the operating table with doctors and nurses struggling to revive their body. The second thing these people report is a tremendous sense of peace and relief. Nothing in their previous life seems important. They are never again fully relaxed and experience a sense of bliss. Thirdly, they report seeing a distant bright light that begins to move faster and faster. As they move toward this light, the feeling of peace, happiness and euphoria increases. They feel completely relaxed and in harmony with the universe. As the light becomes brighter and brighter, the fourth common occurrence reported by people who have gone through a near-death experience is that, on the other hand, they are asked two questions. What have you learned in this life? And how have you increased your capacity to love in this life? Back at the operating table, the surgical staff resuscitates the body and brings it back to life. Suddenly, the person feels as if they are being sucked back away from the light at an increasing speed. In a way, everything turns black. The next thing people remember is waking up in a hospital room with family members and medical staff surrounding them. So now we know. At the end of your life, there is a final exam. We even know the questions on that exam. 
Throughout our lives, one of the main goals is to develop excellent answers to those questions. This is the big business of life. Having these good answers, what have you learned? And how has your capacity to love increased? On the other hand, I want to talk to you about how important the power of positive thinking is. Indeed, the idea that the mind can change your world seems too good to be true. I can assure you, however, that I have experienced and witnessed the good that having a positive mindset can bring. Both positive and negative thoughts are powerful, but they have opposite outcomes. Today, I want to talk to you about how both can impact you and how the power of positive thinking can truly transform every aspect of your life. Positive thinking means you seek solutions and expect to find them. You don't ignore problems, but instead of complaining about them or letting them dominate you, you actively seek ways to overcome them. You take constant responsibility for your life because you understand that you are in control of how your life progresses. A positive thinker finds the benefits or the silver lining in challenges and expects things to turn out well. Having a positive attitude means you have an optimistic outlook. An optimistic attitude means you have hope, believe things will turn out well, and ultimately, you will succeed. Scientists have been studying the health benefits of positive thinking for a long time. Research suggests that positive people have better mental and physical health and even live longer. Having a positive outlook can reduce the risk of having a heart attack, catching a cold, and being depressed. Positive thinking can reduce a person's risk of dying from serious illnesses, such as cancer, infections, heart disease, strokes, and lung conditions. It improves the outcomes for patients with brain tumors and traumatic brain injuries, and boosts their immune system. A positive mental state even gives you a higher pain tolerance. When you have a positive outlook, you are better equipped to face stress and difficulties. Think more creatively, and are better at problem solving. Thinking positively puts you in a better mood so you can build positive relationships with co-workers, family members, friends, and new acquaintances. How is a positive mindset recognized? People with positive attitudes tend to have a healthy lifestyle, smile more, are more pleasant to be around, and are calmer under pressure. Someone with a more positive outlook is often willing to try new things, has higher self-esteem, loves to laugh, and points out the silver lining in every dark cloud. A positive outlook is contagious, and people with a positive outlook cannot help but share it with those around them. Positive thoughts are always kind to people and do not speak negatively about themselves or others. People with more positive thoughts have better coping skills and know how to handle stress better, doing things like exercising more frequently and having a healthier diet. Now, as we continue our exploration into the power of positive thinking, let's delve into practical strategies for transforming negative self-talk into uplifting affirmations. As Brian Tracy aptly emphasized, our internal dialogue plays a pivotal role in shaping our attitudes and outlook on life. Indeed, the words we speak to ourselves, whether consciously or subconsciously, have a profound impact on our self-esteem and overall well-being. By replacing pessimistic thoughts with positive affirmations, we can cultivate a mindset of resilience, optimism, and self-belief. But how exactly can we shift from negative to positive self-talk? Brian offers us some invaluable insights and techniques to help guide us on this transformative journey. Instead of dwelling on our limitations and past failures, we can choose to focus on our potential and future successes. By adopting a mindset of growth and possibility, we empower ourselves to overcome obstacles with courage and determination. As Brian so eloquently puts it, we should strive to be our own biggest cheerleaders, celebrating our progress and learning from our setbacks along the way. So the next time you catch yourself succumbing to negative self-talk, remember that you have the power to reframe your thoughts and beliefs. Instead of asking, what if I fail? Dare to ask, what if I succeed? Embrace the possibilities that lie ahead and watch as your positive attitude propels you towards greater heights of success and fulfillment. When you have positive thoughts, you don't allow your conscious or subconscious mind to entertain negative thoughts or doubts. Positive thoughts can literally be the key to success. After you learn to think positively, you'll notice amazing changes around you. Your brain will actually start operating in a state of feel-good hormones freely flowing, called endorphins, which will make you feel lighter and happier. You'll also notice a significant boost in confidence and feel more capable of taking on new tasks and challenges that may have previously been outside your comfort zone. By reducing your self-limiting beliefs, you'll effectively release your breaks and experience growth like you never imagined. Essentially, 
you can change your entire life simply by harnessing the power of positive thinking. And as we bring our journey to a close, let us take a moment to reflect on the incredible potential that resides within each and every one of us. Today, we've explored the idea that you are destined to surprise the world with your success. And indeed, that destiny is within your grasp. As you move forward on your path to greatness, remember that success is not a destination, but a journey. A journey defined by courage, resilience, and unwavering determination. Along the way, you may encounter obstacles and setbacks, but know that each challenge is an opportunity for growth and learning. Believe in yourself, trust in your abilities, and never underestimate the power of your dreams. For it is through perseverance and perseverance alone that we can overcome the odds and achieve the extraordinary. So, as you venture forth into the world, carry with you the unwavering belief that you are capable of achieving greatness. You have the talent, the passion, and the drive to make a profound impact on the world around you. Embrace the challenges that lie ahead, for they are the stepping stones to your success. And remember, the world is waiting to be surprised by the remarkable achievements that only you can bring to life. Thank you for joining me on this inspiring journey. May you continue to chase your dreams with courage and conviction. And may your success serve as a beacon of hope and inspiration to all those around you. Now go forth and surprise the world with your greatness. Your destiny awaits, and the world is ready to be amazed by all that you will achieve. The rules for achieving financial independence are simple. The rules are as follows. Rule number one. Spend less than you earn, and then save or invest the difference. This has always been the case. It's the key to financial success going back to The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Clayson more than 2,000 years ago. You can be working an average job, whether it's at a gas station, on a farm, or driving a truck. But if you save $100 a month on average from age 20 to age 65 and let it accumulate, you'll be worth more than a million. $100 a month, $25 a week, or less than $4 a day. That's about the same amount as buying a latte at Starbucks. Can you do that? Okay, well, do lots of other things, but do that for sure. Now, rule number two for achieving financial independence is that 10% of every dollar you earn is yours to keep. What this means is that you need to develop a habit from the beginning of your career of cutting 10% off the top of your salary and living on the other 90%. Most people get their paycheck and they spend most of it. If there's anything left over, they throw it in the bank temporarily, and then they grab it out and spend it on something else. They look at their bank account and shout, Gee, we've got money here, let's burn it. Some people have just got to get rid of the money. Rule number three is to resolve in advance to prefer financial independence to status. The work in The Millionaire Next Door found that the mark of self-made millionaires is that they weren't concerned about impressing the neighbors or keeping up with the Joneses. They were more concerned with financial independence. So, say to yourself, financial independence is number one to me, and status is number two, three, four, or ten. And be willing to stick to it. It's absolutely amazing what will happen to you financially. Do you know what we found out about self-made millionaires? They never buy new cars. Why? Because in a new car, there's several thousand dollars of depreciation that's money that you lose the minute you drive it off the lot. So, what self-made millionaires do, based on interviews with thousands of them, is they pick a car they really like, they follow it in Consumer Reports and J.D. Power for quality and service, and then about two to three years out, they look for used models with low mileage and good service records, and then they buy a car that 20 to 25% in depreciation has already been taken out of. I've worked with a man once who started with nothing and achieved a net worth of $800 million. Now, he lived in a nice normal neighborhood, you know, with doctors, lawyers, and architects, but not ostentatious. But the people living on either side of him were just two paychecks away from homelessness. If their income was cut off for two months, they wouldn't be able to make their mortgage payments. I watched this guy. He drove the same used car for three or four years. He liked Cadillacs. He'd get a nice Cadillac, take good care of it, and then he'd get another used or a newer vehicle from a dealership, so that it had already been depreciated. He was never ostentatious at all, and he ended up one of the richest men in America. When you met him, he'd be wearing an old sweater. He didn't have a huge wardrobe or the same suits to meetings, and he had no bills at all. But when he wanted to go somewhere, he'd fly in his private $25 million jet all by himself. Now back to the last rule for achieving financial independence. 
Rule number four is once you put the money away, never touch it. This is important. So if you're writing it down, write it in red. You see, many of us make the mistake of thinking that if you save money, you put that money away so you can have it. It's fun money. So when you decide, I want to buy a car, or I want to go on a trip, or I want a boat, you go and you get this money that you saved. However, if you want to spend money on those things, set up a separate savings account. This money is for your financial security. This is your financial freedom fund. Once you put money into this financial freedom account, you lock it in like a one-way door. It goes in and it never comes out. You never spend it. I can tell you all kinds of stories about how this will change your life, including in my life. But please believe me, once you put it away and decide that you will never spend it, as far as you're concerned, it's gone forever. I personally will do whatever is necessary, no matter what my financial emergency is, to not touch my financial fortress. Never touch it. Because if you even think, even a tiny glimmer that you can get it if you need it, then you'll find yourself needing it at the first opportunity. So the key to financial success is, pay yourself first. Save 10% of your income. Buy used things rather than new. And once you put money away, never, never touch it. Put it away and let it stay there until it accumulates and enables you to do anything you want in life. Today in America, it's a little different because of the state of the economy. And of course you bought low and sold high, but very few of us did that. 10 to 20% per year after taxes and expenses in terms of growing your net worth is a pretty good goal, and it's ultimately achievable. So, write down five figures representing your target net worth over the next five years. It seems remarkable, but the fact is that the starting point of increasing your income or your net worth is very simple. Can you guess what it is? Decide to do it. Make a decision to become financially independent. You say, well, it's not that simple. Well, it is that simple. It's just not easy. Easy, but it is simple. The primary reason that people don't succeed in life or finances is because they never decide to and then back up that decision with determination. Now, there are a lot of things you can do after you've made a decision, but there are very few things you can do before making a decision or without making a decision. So, make that decision. Your decision may be wrong or it may be inaccurate, but at least it's a great starting point. It's like drawing a line in the ground that you step over. What if I don't get it by such and such a date? Don't worry about it. At least get it on paper and take the first step. Once upon a time when I started my career, I sat down at the end of the year, and my tax returns were $14,400. Twelve years later, I sat down and did my tax returns, and my tax returns were $1,440,000. I'd increased my income by a hundred times in 12 years. And I went back and I started to look at that. And I realized that I used a formula, which I gradually articulated into what I call the 1% formula. It's very simple. It's based on the law of incremental improvement. Japanese call it the Kaizen principle. The principle of continuous betterment. It's getting a little bit better every day. So I asked the question, if you could increase your productivity, performance and output by one-tenth of one percent per day, could you do that? Could you increase your productivity, performance and output by one thousandth in a day? And the answer is, of course. If you're even the tiniest bit more efficient, or you worked a little bit harder on a more important task, you could become a tenth of a percent better in a day. Well, if you did that every single day for a week, it would be one-tenth of one percent times five. You'd be one-half of one percent more productive in a week. Is that possible? Of course you would say, anybody can become that small amount more productive. So, I said, if you did that every week for four weeks, you'd be 2% more productive over the course of a month. If you did that every day for 52 weeks in a year, you'd be 26% more productive. Is that possible? And the answer is yes. Because there is a thing at success called the momentum principle. That means that once you start going, it becomes easier and easier to keep going and to go faster and faster. So. Once you become 26% more productive in the course of a year, your overall output, your results, your income will go up by 26%. What happens is you start to get into the swing of it. You start to be more effective, more efficient. You get more things done. You start earlier, you work harder, you stay later, you set better priorities, and so on. So, if you do this 26% each year for 10 years, you will be 104% better. And this is what happened to me and it's happened to every single person I've ever worked with. Not long ago I was in Seattle, and this young man came up to me. 
He's about 30. I met him when he was about 22. He was working in a used car lot in a small town outside of Portland. His name is Chris. And he came up and said, Mr. Tracy, do you remember me? I said, yes, Chris, of course. Nice guy, great personality. He said, well, you know the 1% formula that you taught me many years ago? I said, yes, I remember because I've taught it to so many people. He said, Brian, it doesn't work. I said, it doesn't work? He said, it doesn't work. I said, how do you mean? He smiled and said, it doesn't take 10 years, it only took me 7. He said today he's earning 10 times what he was earning 7 years ago. He said, I used it every day, it's absolutely amazing. I'm making more money today in a week or a month than I was often making in a month or a year by using that formula. What I did personally is I used it once, increased my income 10 times, and then I used it again, and increased my income 10 times more, 100 times in 12 years. And so can you. There are two great principles of wealth attainment, and they're both equally important to understand and implement in order to be successful and acquire wealth. The first principle of wealth creation is to make compound interest work in your favor. Einstein said that compound interest is the most powerful force in the universe. Get that money in there and get it working for you. Peter Lynch of Mellon said that it's not timing the market that makes you rich. It's time in the market that makes you rich. Remember, if you invested $1 at 3% at the time of Christ, you'd be worth all the money in the world today with compound interest. Compound interest is phenomenal. So, make it work in your favor by getting the money in there early and leaving it there to work. The second principle of wealth creation is to use dollar cost averaging. When you buy stocks, don't worry about being right every time or getting the lowest price when you buy. It doesn't really matter, unless of course stocks are overpriced at the end of a boom. But if you invest a steady amount of money every week, or every month or every year, then you'll end up buying things at the average price. The prices will go up and down, but you'll end up buying them high, buying them low, buying them average. And over time, you'll get the very best average deal. Dollar cost averaging is one of the great techniques for financial success. Here's an example of dollar cost averaging. Investing steady, 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 year after year. I have a good friend who came over here as an immigrant at the age of 17, couldn't even speak English. So, he began to learn English. And when he was 20 years old, he could speak enough English to begin studying financial success and going to college. Well, I had dinner with him not long ago. He had a four-acre property, and a 16,000 square foot home in a beautiful community on the East Coast. He's worth millions of dollars today. He owns banks, shopping centers, and national corporations. Here's what happened. When he was 20, someone told him that real estate is the key to financial success. They're not making any more of it. You should own real estate. Well, he never thought about that, and at that time, he was a student and didn't have very much money, but he was working evenings and weekends to pay for his needs which is what they used to do in those days. So he decided he would buy one piece of property each year. His first piece of property was in a small community outside of town, and it was a lot, and it cost $25 a month to service it. He had the sweat to make those monthly payments. But his goal was to buy one piece of property a year, and he kept on doing it. He's now 49 years old, and the last piece of property he bought last year was a $225 million shopping center. He still buys one property a year. Only now, they're much, much bigger. The skill and experience and discipline that he developed over time in buying those properties, which got bigger and bigger, made him a millionaire, and then a multi-millionaire. So, what's your excuse? What's our excuse? We're surrounded by hundreds, thousands, even millions of these stories. What is our excuse? It's always one thing. Lack of discipline. So, remember the two great principles of wealth creation. Making compound interest work for you by getting the money in there and working, and using dollar cost averaging, whether it's buying stocks or real estate. Next is maximize. Determine your special talents, abilities, and strengths, and focus on developing them to a higher level. Then multiply. Leverage yourself and your business with other people's customers, other people's knowledge, other people's abilities, other people's efforts, other people's money, and other people's resources. Now you've heard the old saying, it takes money to make money. Yes, that's true, but it doesn't have to be your money. It can be somebody else's money. All successful people have developed the ability to call on the money of others. Why? 
It's because they do good work, and they do good planning, and they take good care of their money, and people line up to give them money. There's now trillions of dollars of money waiting. I have a good friend, one of my business partners, mostly a multimillionaire, started with nothing, and he's worth tens of millions of dollars. He's sitting on a pool of money that he keeps at very low levels of interest. He said, I can't find a place to put it, and I will not put it until I find a place. If somebody could come along with any kind of a business proposition where the person has credibility and a track record and has a good business proposition, there's more money available than you can dream of. The money is there in torrents, like tsunamis of money that are available. That's why you're reading the paper. You read that such and such company just paid 18 billion or 26 billion or Google just offered Groupon $6 billion cash for their business. There's lots of money for good business ideas, but it doesn't have to be your money. It can be somebody else's money. And your ability to attract that money and to justify it is really important. Strategic planning is an essential part of the success formula. Your ability to create a clear and organized strategic plan will largely contribute to your success and wealth. In fact, it's virtually impossible to succeed greatly unless you have a clear idea of where you're going and how to get there. So, here are three key factors to remember when devising a strategic plan. Number one, you are in business for yourself. This means that everything that is ever going to happen to your personal success or corporation, your personal business, is up to you. No one else can be expected to do it for you. Now here's a perverse law. The more that you accept that you are responsible for doing whatever it is, the more others will line up to help you. So therefore you say these words, if it's to be, it's up to me. Number two, your aim in strategic planning is to increase your return on energy. Why call this ROE, return on energy? The purpose of strategic planning in business is to increase return on equity, return on capital working in the organization. But your capital is mental, emotional, and human. Your job is to get the most out of your mental, emotional, and intellectual capital. Your job is to get the highest return on energy. My friend Ken Blanchard says you want to get the highest return on the amount of your life invested in your work. Number 3. Successful individuals also have good personal strategic plans. Because a good strategic plan assures that you will get the highest return on the amount of energy that you invest in anything you do. A positive attitude is like a chicken and egg thing. If you're successful, you're positive. If you're positive, you're successful. Which comes first? It doesn't really matter. Positive thinkers are men and women who accomplish an awful lot more than people who have negative mental attitudes. Your job is to become thoroughly positive and constructive towards yourself, your possibilities, the world around you, and the people in your life. The way you do this is very much the same way you develop physical fitness. We know that you can't see the results of mental fitness in the same way you can see physical fitness, but you can see the results of it. Mental fitness comes from following a specific exercise program, doing things in a certain way every single day. It's much easier than going to a gym and sweating and working out. So I'm going to ask you to do this for me. I'm going to give you seven steps, seven things that you can do, seven things that have been proven to work. What I'm going to ask you to do is practice these seven steps for 21 days. The reason for this is that it takes 21 days to develop a new habit pattern of any kind. If you work on a habit pattern and practice it every day, you begin to develop new neural grooves in your brain that cause you to think and act more optimistically automatically. You wake up in the morning feeling better, more positive toward the challenges you face during the day. You become more optimistic in the face of adversity, start to become a more confident and optimistic person. When you do, you'll find your whole life opening up around you like sunshine on a bright morning. This is the great rule of success. Number one is positive self-talk. Positive self-talk has been getting very good press in the last little while. Positive self-talk means that you talk to yourself and make sure that your thoughts are on what you want and off of the things that you don't want. Successful people, positive people, are people who explain things to themselves in a positive way. They say, well, that's an interesting situation, or that'll work out okay, or don't worry about it. The second part of positive self-talk is to control your inner dialogue, to control what's happening inside you, and to be aware that the average person, if they're not careful, will have a tendency to be negative. Remember, 95% of your feelings are determined by the way you talk to yourself. It's absolutely essential that you talk to yourself the way that you want to be. Outside, 
what you see in your relationships, your health, your work, your customers and so on, tend to be a result of the pictures you have inside. If you see yourself and think about yourself as an extraordinary person, if you see yourself as a success, if you see yourself as happy and positive, confident and in control, if you see yourself as a loving parent or spouse, you will act that way toward others. Your subconscious mind controls your reticular activating system or your reticular cortex as well. If you interview successful people, it's a very interesting thing. If you interview successful people and you ask them on a regular basis, what do you think about? What are you thinking about now? You find that successful people are always thinking constructive, positive, creative thoughts that help them to be more successful. Now, if you think about positive, constructive, success-oriented, happy things, you start to have more of those in your life. The fourth part of mental programming, the fourth part, is positive people. We have a tendency to adopt the words, the actions, the behaviors, the mannerisms, the dress of the people we associate with most of the time, if we're not very careful. Get away from negative people, get around positive people, associate with winners in your life. The fifth part is positive training and development. Most of your success is going to come from other people. Most of your success is going to come from someone who helps you. And people like to help other people who are good at what they do, and who are pleasant and easy to get along with. Wait an hour a day. 30 to 60 minutes every day will make you one of the greatest authorities in your field in a couple of years. Listen to educational and uplifting audio cassettes in your car. When all knowledge and skills are becoming obsolete, it's the ability to learn new things at a rapid rate. So, dedicate yourself to lifelong continuous personal improvement. Number six is positive health habits. First of all, eat lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, lots of whole grain products. Second of all, stop eating fats, sugars, and salts. Third of all, drink lots of water. And fourth of all, get lots of exercise. Lock, head on to an aerobic exercise program. Regular rest and recreation are absolutely critical to having high levels of physical energy, which gives you the optimism and confidence to be able to bounce when you face the adversities of daily life, rather than breaking. The seventh key to mental fitness, we call this a sense of urgency. There are many qualities that you can develop to be successful, but a sense of urgency is possessed by less than 2% of the population. These are the people who are almost magnets for opportunities. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. I'm telling you, my life exploded into change. My bank account changed immediately. My income changed immediately. With a little consideration of the refinement of your sale, by setting a better sale, refining your philosophy, your whole life can start to change from the day on. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait till next month to start this whole process immediately. Now some people do so little thinking they don't even have their sale up. Now is the chance to change. Number one is velocity. My personal opinion, each person's personal philosophy, here's the definition of success and failure. Sometimes the first year, you say, well, you know, I'm so healthy now. What difference is it going to make? You've got to be smarter than that. Just because disaster doesn't fall on us at the end of the first day, doesn't mean disaster isn't coming. You've got to be so smart that you look down the road and say, well, the errors in my present judgment or philosophy, what's that going to cost me in one year, six years, one month, six months? I'm telling you, the money cost and the health cost and the success cost is too gigantic if you look down the road a little ways and say, are there errors in my current judgment? Like an apple versus a Hershey bar? Is that just a good illustration of some of the rest of my errors in judgment? If it is, that's where I found myself at age 25. At the end of the first six years of my economic life, I've got pennies in my pocket. I've got nothing in the bank. The creditors are calling, saying, Hey, you told us the check was in the mail. I'm embarrassed. I'm behind on my promise. I used to think it was the community that was messed up. And the country was messed up. The government was messed up. Then I found out what was really messed up was my own personal philosophy. My own errors in judgment in my own personal philosophy brought me, in six years, pennies in my pocket, nothing in the bank, and trying to explain why I wasn't doing well living in America as a 25-year-old American male with a family. Every reason to do well here. Here's the formula for failure. Errors in judgment being lax about developing your own personal philosophy. Come on now. Let me give you the secret to success. The formula for failure, 
A few errors in judgment repeated every day for one month starts the weakness, starts the disaster process. You can imagine what happened. Now here's the formula for success. A few simple disciplined practices every day, and you've started the whole new process called a whole new life. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. It's not only with your health habits, but with your money habits, and with your communication habits, with your sales habits, management habits, and every other habit that you've got. If you'll start that process, eliminate the errors, and replace it with disciplined practice, you can start this process of life change immediately after today. You don't ever have to be the same again. You don't have to start with something staggering. What if you should be walking around the block for your good health, and you don't? What did that do in six years? I'm telling you, the word is disaster. You could and you should, and you don't. Here's an even stronger word. You won't. I mean don't might mean you're careless. Won't probably means you're stubborn, and either one's called disaster. Now how do you change all that the next six years? By the time I'm 31 I'm a millionaire. How about that? Well, strangely enough, during that second six years of my economic life, the economy was about the same, and prices were about the same, and everything else was about the same, circumstances were about the same. Then how come I got rich? How come I totally changed my life? I was not the same. I started with my philosophy. I started amending my errors by doing some better thinking, changing my mind, coming up with ideas that I didn't have before I met my teacher. And once that whole process started for me, I'm telling you, I changed my whole life within a six-year period. I was never the same, and I've kept up that process all these years. Your philosophy is going to determine whether or not you go for the disciplines or continue the errors. That's called potential. Everybody has it within their view. God didn't say, hey, as simple as an apple a day, as simple as a walk around the block. Why not start right there? If you don't start there, where else are you going to start? Might as well start where it's easy, then go to the more complicated. Because if you can't handle the complicated, the simple disciplines, how can you handle the complicated? Thank you. Hold on. Here's number two. Number one, we're affected by philosophy first. Major of the five major pieces. Number two is attitude. We're affected by how we feel first. We're affected by what we know, decisions we make second. We're affected by attitude, how we feel. It's how you feel about the past. Gotta have a good attitude about the past. Let the past be a schoolmaster to teach you, not to threaten you, but to teach you. Next, it's how you feel about the future. Goal setting. The promise of the future has an awesome effect on your life every day. Without a future well designed, we take hesitant steps. You know, do you have to have hesitant steps for six years? You can have driven into a corner, not boldly willing to go and take your portion, take your share. Next, it's how you feel about everybody else. Gotta have a good attitude about everybody else because it takes everybody else to make a market. And here's the last one. That's how you feel about yourself. Understanding self-worth is the beginning. Self-worth should be easy. If one of us can do it, all of us can. If anybody can think it, we all think it. I can read, you can read. I can understand, you can understand. From where I came from, a few simple things I didn't try revolutionize my life in five years. Is there anybody here that can't do it? Change from pennies to fortune, change from betting to something, change from broke to rich. That's the attitude about yourself. So valuable. Okay, now in transforming our lives, we don't start with attitude. We don't start with inspiration. We start with education. Life change starts with education. You've got to be educated to the point of where you might have messed up. And all you've got to do is write down through the list. You don't need some teacher to come by and tell you, be your own best teacher, saying, hey, let me make a list of some places I've messed up. Because if you let this down, let this down, that probably affects the rest. And the answer is that's true. So, we don't start with inspiration, we start with education. What's the first education? If it isn't going well and you live in America, you have foreign countries. You say, well the country's messed up. That's like cursing the soil and cursing the seed and the sunshine and the rain, which is all you've got. Don't curse the soil. You get your own planet. You can rearrange this whole deal. This one you've got to take like it comes. So number two is attitude. Here was number three. Activity. 
This is the work part, the labor part, taking action. The activity is the miracle working piece. Miracle being something we don't quite understand how it works, doesn't mean it doesn't work if you're willing to straighten it out. Here's one of the keys. It's called activity. It's called disciplines. Turning wisdom from your philosophy and inspiration. Strengthening of attitude and faith. Courage. Commitment. All this stuff that comes from attitude. If you're willing to take these two qualities, philosophy and attitude, and invest them into activity, you can have a miracle. Anything short of that, no miracle. Wisdom doesn't perform a miracle. Attitude doesn't perform a miracle. The only thing that performs a miracle of increase is called equity. It's called putting wisdom and attitude into disciplined labor. This labor now can perform a miracle. And here are the two parts of the labor. 1. Do what you can. Number 2. Do the best you can. Can't give you better advice than that. Number 1. Do what you can. You just gotta go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do? That could greatly change my health? My wealth? What am I not doing? I'm neglecting it. Would be easy to do. If you'll take care of your part, called putting it into activity, action works miracles. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done, postpone, and start cleaning that up. You can't start at a better place for personal change. It'll affect your bank account. Affect your future. Affect your income. Affect everything. You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, Well, my mother lives down in Florida. I should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter in, clean that up. And don't walk like other people walk, don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing a letter? And the answer is yes. Where else would you start for life change, personal change? You don't need a big package to fall out of the sky. You don't need massive bombardment, pre-conscious, subconscious, practice channeling, find a 2000 year old guru. I mean, you don't need any of that stuff. Pass on all that. Kids are afraid of that stuff. Too much of it. You'll be out on a limb with Shirley. I mean, no, pass on all this stuff. This stuff's too easy. This stuff's too simple. It's called taking action. Number one, correct neglect. Correct errors and discipline. Number two, start setting up some disciplines. And if you'll do that, you'll perform a miracle. Now here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is do what you can. Here's number two. Do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, it ought to be amended. The guy slips in late. Company doesn't seem to mind. Flips out early. First one in the parking lot. Heading for happy hour. Stretches his break. Comes early for lunch. Laid back from lunch. Company doesn't seem to notice. Guy says, Best as I can calculate. I'm putting in about a half a day's work, and I'm collecting a full day's pay. And the guy says, I got it made. Little does he know. The seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor, about activity, about miracle, about soil and seed, sunshine and rain, the economy, the banks, the money, the companies, the schools, and what's going on. It's your philosophy, and your attitude, and then your ability to take action, all of that we call the process of life change. Miracle working. Here was number four. Results. Every once in a while, you've got to take a measure to see how you're doing with these three pieces. Philosophy, attitude, activity. Now we take a measure called results. What are the results at the end of the day, the results at the end of the week? You can't let too much time go by without checking. When time goes by six years, I've been out there working. When I met my teacher, Mr. Shof, he said, Well, Mr. Ron, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, In the last six years, how much money have you saved and invested? Let's go through a little tab list here. How much money have you saved and invested in the last six years? I said, What? Zero. He said, You have messed up. You remember these notes? I like that. Messed up. He said, who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. What if you were 50 and broke, right? Didn't need to change countries, bought the wrong plan. 
What a sad scenario that would be. Shof said, These questions, let's go through some results. He said, How many books have you read in the last 90 days? I said, What? Zero. Wisdom of the world available. Change your life, change your future. Wisdom of the world available. Develop any skill you want. Earn the kind of income you want. Have all the treasures you want. Relationships with your family that you want. Everything that you want available. And the wisdom of the world to help you get it. Haven't read any books in the last 90 days. My teacher said, Mr. Ron, you have messed up, I'm telling you. You've got the deal. Chove said, Mr. Ron, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills? Go for the American dream. Become rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many classes have you taken in the last six months? I said, how many? Zero. He said, you have messed up. Said, you don't need to unmask the country. You don't need to straighten out the perplexed. You don't need to straighten out any of this stuff. All you've got to do is look within and let results teach you a great deal about your own activity, your own attitude, and your own philosophy. I went through that process. Here's all life asks us to do. Make measurable progress in reasonable time. Some things you've got to check every day. Some things you've got to check at least by the end of the week. A salesman joins us at a little sales company, supposed to make 10 calls the first week. Wouldn't it be legitimate, calling in on Friday and say, John, how many calls? I mean, this stuff is simple. John says, well, say, John, well, won't fit in this little box here. Well, now John starts with the story. You say, John, I made this little box so small so a story won't fit. I don't need a story. I need what? A number. What will the number tell me? Everything. John's supposed to make 10 calls. What if he made 20? You'd say, wow. What if he only made one call? Will that tell us something about John's philosophy? And the answer is yes. Will it tell us something about his attitude? Of course. Will it tell us something about his disciplines? Of course. And if he wants a lesson in life change, all he has to do is be willing to face the numbers and come up with the results that will teach you to either celebrate if you've got good results or fix whatever needs to be fixed in your philosophy, attitude and activity called disciplines. You don't need to go anywhere else. I do believe in affirmations. Now, if you need a little additional affirmation, you just put up there on 40 and broke. I mean, you know, that ought to do it. And if you need just a little more, put up there, I live in America, and I'm 40 and broke. That's enough to turn your life around. It says, hey, something is wrong somewhere, I have messed up. And I'm telling you, if you'll start with that, it's called the process of life change. And it doesn't matter how small the process is to start, one discipline starts it, and then one discipline feeds another, feeds another, and the first thing you know, you've got this whole cycle in an upward positive motion. It's called life change, called income change, it's called health change, relationship with your family change, equities unprecedented that you can have in numbers that will stagger the imagination. If you do not curse what's available and start amending what's possible to get the results that you want, anybody can do this stuff. Results are the name of the game. Success is a numbers game. Good note to me. Said that it's a numbers game. You've got to go for the number. You've got to understand what the numbers are.